Hi everyone, this is Kyle with KDebate. I have my setup still. I messed with my m microphone settings. It was very quiet last time, so I upped it 20 something percent. Hopefully it works better. Uh, today I want to talk about Venezuela. I've mentioned it before, and it's still going on. The, um, the protests and, and the, the corruption scandals and the, the anti-protest military exercises, they're still going on. And they've gotten bigger, like significantly bigger. Uh, just um, not that long ago, uh, this month, um, there has been a million-person march on the government in Venezuela, which is um, it's big. It's one of the biggest in history. Uh, I believe uh, there's been a couple recently that are just as big in countries that are uh, much more publicly, you know, they're, they're more in the public eye, the international public eye. Venezuela is generally pushed down on the priorities of the United States. We don't care very much. Uh, it's, it's in South America. It's just a part of South America. It's not, it's not one that a lot of people go to. Um, and since oil hasn't really been a hot topic for a while, Venezuela, 95% of their economy was based off of oil. So they were a really big player for a long time, but once oil prices started going down, their economy collapsed. Uh, the the horrible corruption that everyone knew about in their government came to a head when they lined their pockets with money and left the normal people to starve. And one of my friends does live in Venezuela. They have been um, struggling, uh, to say the least. And they've been trying to, as they've always been, to prevent me from getting involved in any fashion. And I, I recently talked to them today about Venezuela in depth and they do not like talking about it. They do not like the idea of questioning, not because they don't want it to get better, they don't believe it will get better. So they're like, can't do anything about it, don't bother with it. it causes them stress and anxiety. Their entire adult life has been Venezuela in the toilet. And because Venezuela has been really bad for a really long time. And it's, it's just gotten to the point where, you know, you grow up there, apparently, as far as I can tell from what he's told me, um, the government has always been for itself and not the people. The police uh, are corrupt. The, um, the politicians are generally incapable of doing anything against that. And the people suffer because there's not, the infrastructure collapsed. The, the, they, don't, they don't have, like they, they do, but on a much smaller scale than is necessary, they don't really have farms. They don't really have stuff that they themselves built to sustain themselves once their money ran out because they bought everything. They had so much oil money. They, it was a very rich country. They can import what they wanted. When that fell apart, the country fell apart. Starvation became rampant. And so the people started suffering more and more and more. 2014 is when the protests really, really started. And they were, you know, tens of thousands of people protesting. They were pretty much hit with military force almost immediately. At first it was the police. They pushed against the police. Military came in, pushed against that. More military. And it just escalated very quickly over the course of two years. And it went from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to a million people just this month. And the reason I'm making this video specifically, the reason I brought this up, is because there's, there's really two ways this can happen. Well, there's a couple of variants that I guess you can determine would be different, but there's two main things. Civil war or the president resigns on his own accord. And those are the two, those are the only two options I can foresee because the million person march was to have him removed from office. That is what it was for. And he, he has been saying for the past several years, um, pretty much whenever he was questioned, is you're a fascist, and if you don't stop, I'm going to have you arrested. He's had virtually all of his opponents arrested. Uh, anyone who publicly criticizes him arrested. Uh, the first protest that was any size, it was tens of thousands of people, over 4,000 people were arrested 
from that. And that's what I mean by the, the police getting to shut them down. And then more pro protests happened, and they, the, the military and the, um, the police shoot protesters, not with rubber bullets, with real bullets. And they're not supposed to do that. So the leader of the country is calling all protesters fascists. People that want to come in and help the people, he's calling them enemies of the state because they're questioning his authority. There, he is a dictator. He is he is the fascist dictator. He he is under a socialist um, party, but he's not really a socialist. He's a dictator. He's the difference between a socialist party and a a communist or 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 dictator based regime. Um, I, I, I said communist because it's what people associate with regimes. Socialism is the mixture of pretty much capitalism and communism in, in kind of a, a jumbled up mess. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It, it means that if it's run properly, it would be better than... Um, it's, it's like Denmark or Norway or any of those other kind of countries. They're generally considered pretty nice places to live. When you have a massive corrupt government that mismanages money, that mismanages criticism, that mismanages authority, their own authority is not allowed to be questioned. So they're, they're not allowing public discourse and they've accrued more and more power and the people finally figured it out. Uh, they, they've known. But it's hit a critical mass, is what I mean, is millions of people are getting involved in this. And this latest protest of over a million people, roughly a million people, uh, shows that it's not slowing down. And the military can't handle it anymore. Even if he put the entire military to shut down the protesters. Like, if you have 10,000 protesters and you have maybe 500 police officers, you can probably shut it down. You have a million people marching, you can't stop that. You can have the military gunning them down. That's not going to stop the protest. It's going not well that one maybe. But now there now you have the entire country against you, not just those million people, not just the five or ten million people that might have been on the fence about it. Now you have the entire country against you. And you'd have to dictate military law at that point. And this is, this is the other thing that I, I, I realize. When I say he has to stand down or he's going to be forcibly removed, um, when, when you have a majority of people that don't want you there, you have to either stop them or placate, placate them, which sounds easy when you have so much power it's just you just do something distract them or, or do something and, and make them happy and he can't do that anymore the 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 international eye well not necessarily in the united states but around the world is starting to notice all of the neighboring countries around venezuela know what's going on there they know that he's a dictator and that he's hurting his own people and they don't like that so at one point he opened the uh, it was over the course of about 3 or 4 weeks. He opened the border on I believe it was a Saturday so that people can go across the border, buy things and come back. He did that for a day. It's like it's open now and people ran across the border and grab, bought as much stuff as they could and ran back because they were starving. And he's like, "Okay, it's it's closed again the next day. It's only open for a day." But you guys have food now. Cool. And then the next week, he did it again. People ran across the border again en masse. Tens of thousands of people. Because they were literally starving. And so he did that again. I believe he did it three times. It might have been a few more. Uh, and then the government that he was letting them go into, I don't remember which one it was off the top of my head, they said no. We're not opening the border. Like, we had an open border with you guys. You were the ones that had it shut down. We're shutting it down now unless you open it indefinitely. Because what you're doing 
is you're placating people. You're giving them a band-aid on the festering infected wound that is the government you have imposed upon them. You are starving your own people, giving them a, a day of desperation to come over here and get the stuff that they might need and then go back there into the cesspool that is making them sick in the first place. So, no, we're not letting you do that unless you open it forever because you are not helping your people and we're not going to allow you to use us to do it. So they're aware of what's going on and this million man march, this million person march uh, against him, his government, not Congress, not the Senate, the president and what he has done and and what his father has done because he's he, they were both presidents. All of that put together, the, the international eye is opened on them. And they are, they're becoming more desperate. The government, the president, is becoming more desperate in that there's really no way out of it anymore. He can grab what he can and run, which he might do, especially if, if, because these are mostly pro, uh, peaceful protests, mostly. Uh, when they were clashing against, the, the government has actually paid other protesters, violent pro-government protesters, to kill the other protesters. He has paid them to do that. That is public knowledge. And so that's known that he has done that, that the government has paid violent protesters to kill the peaceful protesters. So all of this stuff is why there was a million person march. Why there was so many people that something like 70% of the, of the people are actively against the president right now. And that was just the amount of people that marched uh, was a, a million. There's more than that. So he cannot say that the people want him there. He was not elected now. He was elected a long time ago. And his, his re-election's coming up. And he will not win that election. There is literally no way he can win that election. His approval rating is something like three... It's less than 10%. So his approval rating is really, really low. And yeah, he can try to rig it or he can lie or anything like that. No one will buy that. So... And even the international people will become involved. Other countries will say, you are be, if, if you did something to rig the election. And it'll be obvious because they're not very good at it. They're, they're not subtle. They're dictators. They don't have to be. They just say, I'm the winner. And that's what North Korea does. That's what a lot of, um, a lot of dictators do. It's like they have an election and there's only one person on the ballot kind of thing. Uh, voting against them is against the law kind of thing. But so you can't do that. He would be, he would be attacked by the people, um, and the military wouldn't back him at that point. The generals might. The generals are in his pocket generally because he generally is, is he pays them exorbitant amounts of money and gives them a lavish lifestyle to do what he says. But the the foot soldiers, the general in military, the vast majority of military are going to side with their families. They're going to side with the people that they see as suffering and they will say, no, I may be part of the military sworn to protect the country. You, the president, are not the country. They are. That will happen. And that's what I mean by a civil war is if the government, the president, orders the military to, to attack the citizens, some will and some won't and then it'll be a military pretty much battle between the loyalists and the revolutionaries I guess would be the word and the people will stand behind the people that are against the government and there's a lot of people in the government that don't want the president there either virtually all of their congress and all of their all of the people that aren't the president or the Supreme Court justices, which were appointed by the president, um, pretty much everyone doesn't like the president. They want him gone. And he is up for re-election soon, a couple years. And hopefully he bows out of it. He leaves. 
or he doesn't fight to keep power, which he can try to do. He can, he's already done several extremely illegal things within his own country. Uh, he has had the Supreme Court justices remove power from the Senate, from his Congress. He's had them remove power from them, give it to him, him use that power to take more people, uh, more power away from the people and give it to himself even though he needed Congress's approval to do that. So he, he used the Supreme Court to remove power from one branch of the government to give it to him so he can enact something that gave him more power. And it was, he's allowed to declare war with himself now. Like he, if he wants, he can just declare war with things without Congress's approval. Like he has, it's a, it's a democracy there. It's like the United States. But he is a dictator that has been controlling every... Like, he appointed this, the Supreme Court justices. They determine what's constitutional or not. But because they listen to him, all he has to do is tell them what to do, and they'll do it. That is corruption. Pure corruption. And the people are aware of it. And when I say civil war, it, it's not an eventuality. It's a very positive... It, it will happen if he doesn't leave. If he doesn't step down, if he fights to keep his power, it will become an inevitability. Uh, but right now, the, uh, there's, there's two things that I see, either him leaving or civil war. And that's what I mean by he either gets re he tries to be reelected or not. But looking at this from, from the outside, I'm not a citizen. My friend is a citizen. He doesn't like to talk about this stuff because he knows if he, the guy tries to maintain his power and there is a civil war, things are going to get bad. Things are already really bad there. Third world countries having um, civil war, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people die. Starvation, um, just outright being murdered. Uh, you know, th they're going to be fighting each other with military equipment. And there's going to be a lot of looting there's going to be a lot of opportunistic crime there's going to be a lot of just people that suffer needlessly because of it and that's that's like worst case scenario my friend dies and completely needlessly and i never get to see him again and that terrifies me and i don't want that to happen and i see it as a potential uh, a potential in in the bad but if he does bow out the president, if he leaves and there isn't a civil war and a new party comes into place, they are literally, not literally, they're going to be rebuilding a bombed out government. And by bombed out, I mean it in the figurative sense. The corruption, the lack of foresight, the, the, their infrastructure is completely worthless to them. The oil factories don't produce money. They, they produce a lot of oil. But oil is not worth anything. It costs more to maintain and to transport and to, and to refine everything than it does generate money. So they're, they're not even paying for the, uh, any kind of um, profit. They're paying to maintain a zero number. And when they want social services like health care or road maintenance, they're not going to have it. So, or food imported. So they're not going to have any of that. And if they're trying to rebuild the infrastructure, it's like, hey, we need farms. Because we don't have farms here. I mean, we have a, a few. Not enough to feed half the nation, let alone all of us. People are going to starve. And, yeah, it'll, it'll get better over time. But you're going to have to start by cutting a lot of stuff just to get the money to pay the people to build the farms to not starve. So people are going to say, well, our roads are deteriorating 10 times faster than they were before. What are you even doing? It's like, we're trying to save you. You're covered in tumors and festering wounds. It's going to hurt to recover. We have to cut out huge chunks of you to do this. And that is another thing that my friend is, is afraid of, is even if someone that wants to help might not even happen, could get a government leader that's even worse, but if you get somebody that does want to help, it's still going to get worse before it gets better because they have to rebuild working through all of this corruption that's been happening for decades. And you have 
You have systems that don't work, laws that don't make sense, uh, people that are still in power that are, you know, parts of the different systems that were put in place years ago that don't want to work with you, that are just like, well, I want, I want what I had before. I want that corruption so I can get from it. It's like, no, we have to get rid of that person now. And then they have to bring new people in, and it's a mess. And so I look at Venezuela, and I am brought to tears sometimes when I think about it. Not right now, because I'm being as serious as possible. But when I was talking to my friend, I very, very got, I got very emotional when I was talking to him, because I was afraid for him. I was afraid for not, not just him, his family, his friends, the people that live there that don't deserve this. And I see it as this tragedy that was completely man-made. They did not have to do this. Their greed, short-sightedness, their, in, their, their inhuman view of the people. Like, you are not deserving of the stuff that we have because we're powerful people. You're just peons to us. You're, you are the working class nobodies that we don't care about. You give us what we want. That's the only reason you're here. And we don't care about anything as long as you're complacent, as long as you're quiet, as long as you give us what we want. That's what the Venezuelan government is right now, and it pains me to see that greatly. And when I was talking to my friend, he again, he doesn't like to talk about it because he doesn't believe it's, it's, he either believes it's going to become a, a civil war or nothing's going to happen. And he, he, he does have... A pessimistic view that the, the, the government's just going to stay there um, no matter what happens and the government's always going to be corrupt that's what he grew up with his entire life has been the corrupt government so he just doesn't see the world being in any different way and they, they have fairly not not really heavy censorship there but when you live in something like that you generally believe that everywhere else is like that and I've tried to explain that it's not like that here except it's becoming that way here and I told him, you know, there are refugee statuses that he can probably, if a civil war starts or if, or if they make it so you can't leave the country, period, um, kind of like the, the, the Iron Curtain kind of thing happened, if they don't want you to leave, you can, you can escape. You can find a way to escape. He's pretty close to a port town. Uh, rent a boat, just go to the Netherlands or something like that. The, and just say, please take us in. We're, we're refugees. We're trying to get away from this dictator. And they know what's going on. So they very much could escape as refugees. Um, and that was what I told him to do. If, if a civil war sparks, he's in a rural enough area that it won't hit them immediately. But if a civil war starts, if the military starts killing people, go to the port town get as much money as you can, find a boat going out, and leave. Just take what you can and leave. And if it dies down, if it was a false alarm, come back if you want, I guess. But otherwise, don't ever come back. Because the Civil War, the, it's just, you can die. And it's not worth, like, your entire life, your culture... Your, your, your family home, your friends, everything like that. Take what you can. Like, try to get as many people as you can if you really, really, like, tell everyone to, to go. But don't die. Don't, don't try to, to save all of these material possessions, possessions. And I have told him that I understand that he grew up there. It's his home. He loves it. But it hurts him. It, it's you, you it's like seeing seeing a loved one passed out drunk on the floor in a in in a pool of their own vomit you love them but it hurts you to see them so messed up it's like why are you like this venezuelan government why do you do this why do you hurt everyone around you why do you hurt yourself and it's for the sake of immediate gratification, not being 
thought in the future of not really loving the people around you that you're supposed to support the government is failing there it has been for decades and it's it's abusive it's it's using the people to get what they at the top want and sorry I just making sure my software is still working um, so I look at all of this and I say they need to do better the government and I'm worried that they're gonna fight tooth and nail to stay being the bad kind of people that they are and they very well could be they very well could fight and start a civil war and because that's how short-sighted I see them but in the coming years one year maybe two or three like max something is going like bad might happen and if it doesn't then it'll, it has a very good chance of getting better uh, but when that re-election hits or these protests force him out early then something's gonna so, something's giving because the protests are gaining a lot of momentum people around the world are starting to notice more and more that the people there are unhappy very unhappy very misused because you see it oh it's a tragedy they're starving how can we help oh the government says it's okay okay it's probably not as bad as we think it is maybe it's just the media blowing it. a million people what how bad is it there we're sending our own journalists over there oh they're censoring our journalists they're not letting our journalists video what's going on now we're gonna investigate that why are they censoring people why are they why are they not letting people in why are they not letting people out why are they why are they arresting their their opponents why are they why are they killing innocent people this stuff needs to be known around the world and that is what's been happening it's starting to get bigger and more well known and they, we've known about it for decades but it's just been like that harmless dictatorship where it's like yeah we know they're corrupt we know they do what they want but you know they still they still give us the oil they still give us what we need and it's, it's like China we know China is kind of messed up but they still give us cheap Nike shoes they still give us all of all of like like most of our knickknacks it's like they're helpful to us even though we know they're corrupt we know they're messed up so we allow it we, we're 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 consumers we like getting what we want and even if it's far away at the expense of somebody else because we don't know them we don't really care very much but now the election once our elections over and we stop talking about it 24 hours a day Venezuela is going to become a pretty big thing maybe not forever it's, it's going to be a temporary maybe a year in the news every every so often but it's going to be there and because it's really not right now and it, it should be like people are dying a lot and it's the government's fault this isn't even conspiracy theory this is well-known stuff I've been like every every day you will see something on Yahoo about Venezuela and they're really like then you'll see something right next to it about Donald Trump Donald Trump thing has like 500,000 views the Venezuela thing has like a thousand I mean people are reading it but only the people that are interested in it and it's not really in the public eye here around the world it's getting bigger and bigger but here we have our election that's what we're focused on so I know that once the election's over and we calm down about it then we'll we'll have more time to realize that's bad and it, it'll become a thing because the United States has been trying periodically to help Venezuela but the Venezuelan government's not allowing us to uh, they're, they're pretty much calling us um, evil uh, invaders I guess is the way to put it and that's not good so it's not accurate either but see all of this is a, is about what's what is going to happen based on for what has been happening now protests are getting stronger there's more of them the military and police response has been getting stronger it's it's becoming more and more unstoppable it's becoming uh, an inevitability that there is going to be a major shift and what that major shift is could become violent or it could be peaceful. I'm hoping for the peaceful one. And even then, it's still going to be really hard. The violent one, bloodbath. Military versus military, people involved, civilians, government officials running for their lives, 
some people might consider that really funny because oh it's poetic justice these corrupt politicians getting murdered by the military I don't consider that a win I consider that a, um, a mixed thing at best it's still loss of life um, so I, I guess that's it it's already a 30 minute video um, I hope this was informative. Uh, look it up, by the way. Just just look up Venezuela stuff. Just just Google it. It's everywhere. But you you don't really see it on our news. You just see it like in Yahoo or or like one or two articles here or there about you know oh this is happening far away kind of thing. And so Google it. Look it up. Re, re it's it's not that hard to read because it's fairly it's in fairly good chunks. Um, so I hope it was informative, I hope it was entertaining, I hope you enjoyed this video, I hope to see you in the next video, and how do I stop this, and peace.